Good evening and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. And I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's forum. Tonight's forum is part of uh, one of many events taking place this week in the um, Harvard for Japan website, which I think we're going to get up on top here, uh, has a listing of it's harvardforjapan.fas. I don't see it yet, so Harvard for Japan, and it's F-O-R, not the little number four, harvardforjapan.fas.harvard.edu. Uh, and I'm very proud of all the activities that are taking place this week on campus as our thoughts and prayers and actions are with the wonderful people of Japan. Tonight's panel is going to be moderated by Christine Russell. Uh, Christine is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and she's a regular contributor to Atlantic.com. One of her more recent posts identified and examined the 10 critical questions about Japan's nuclear crisis, just one of the many challenges facing the recovery effort. So please join me in welcoming Christine and our distinguished panel. Thank you. Well, again, the title of tonight's uh, forum, as you know, is The Earthquake and the Worldwide Aftershocks. And it's nearly two weeks, two weeks tomorrow, since that violent earthquake struck off the coast of northeast Japan. And its magnitude was later determined to be 9.0 and thought by many to be the largest earthquake that had ever hit that country. And of course, we know that the tsunami that followed thereafter swept the coast, swept away uh, villages, and tossed cars and yachts uh, at, like toys. And then the third uh, thing to fall was the nuclear power station at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, when the power was, the water knocked out the power, and then the emergency backup didn't work as well. Uh, one expert this week called it the world's first complex mega disaster. And it is really uh, a very rare uh, confluence of events with high magnitude impact, a kind of triple whammy of back-to-back -back natural disasters followed by a technological disaster. And so tonight we're going to really talk about these aftershocks um, in different ways. Um, but aftershocks, one way to look at it, another is uh, fallout. Um, and the question is how this series of events, which we're just in the midst of, will change Japan in the face of a disaster that so shows no signs at the moment of going away. Although uh, I was pulling out uh, the New York Times from a week ago Thursday. You don't need to read the headline, but you can see there are about five stories. U.S. sees extremely high radiation level at plant, focusing on spent fuel impact, dire appraisal in Tokyo, a dearth of candor, and so on. Uh, I was at another Japan event at Harvard yesterday where people were able to say, you know, it's off the front page, and that was seen as a good sign. Now today, this has been a kind of no hope, new hope, swinging back and forth story. So today, we again are back on the front page with anxiety up as Tokyo issues warning on its tap water. And again, that was this morning in print. Late this afternoon, that story is changing. And fortunately, the latest readings showing that the amount of radioactive uh, isotope is down by half and below the limit for tap water for uh, infants. So this is a story which, even though we've got a lot of communication about it, we don't have all the information, and it's a moving target. So as we look at these aftershocks, um, we're talking about geography from the local, the, the disaster area, the country, the region, and the globe. And uh, with our expert panel, uh, we will examine the human aftershocks, crisis management, nuclear power, and the political and economic aftershocks. And again, I'm going to introduce the panel to my left, uh, alphabetical order. Uh, Matt Bunn, uh, Associate Professor of Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. He's a principal investigator also of the Belfer Center's project on managing the atom. Obviously, his expertise is nuclear power and nuclear proliferation. And he's been at so many events on this topic, he's either Mr. Nuclear or Dr. Pl Plutonium, unfortunately. So <laughs> Matt, Matt Bond. Uh, next to Matt, we have the Honorable Takishi Hikihara, the
the Consul General of Japan here in Boston. He's a 29-year career diplomat who's been stationed around the world from Russia to South Korea. He just arrived here uh, in January, so he's just been in the Boston area for uh, two months. His expertise is law and economics uh, in addition to all of his uh, diplomatic expertise. Next to him we have Herman Dutch Leonard. He's the George F. Baker Professor of Public uh, Policy at Harvard Kennedy School and also a professor of business administration at the Harvard Business uh, School. And his expertise among, again, these are limited ones I'm giving in terms of tonight's forum, crisis management and leadership. And then finally, Susan Farr, Harvard University Reischauer Professor of Japanese Politics, a director of the program on U.S.-Japan relations, the Weatherhead uh, Center for International Affairs. Uh, she has an expertise and focus on Japan and East Asia and research in political behavior, foreign policy, role of the media in politics and so forth. So we're going to have a conversation and, and a conversation among our panel to start with and then bring all of you in later. And so I'm going to start first with uh, the Consul General and, and ask him to give us an update on the human aftershocks. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a lot of global impl implications, but there's been a huge loss of life and he's going to address that and its impact on uh, Japan, both locally and the country, and, uh, and what's happening there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, as of today, there are 9,800 deaths, uh, 17,500 missing, and almost uh, 250,000 people who, are, who have been evacuated. And very un unfortunately, the, the total death toll is uh, still expected to increase. And there is another serious problem, which is uh, uh, on the community level, uh, because of the already devastating uh, tsunami, everything uh, is swept away. So it is, would be a very difficult question after after uh, what happened, uh, whether we can maintain a community in that area. Uh, and to, to maintain a community and to or restore a community is very important for the uh, uh, the construction of the uh, of the life and the economy in that area. And I think you've said that you know town halls are gone, yes. local officials. So there's really not local government to, to turn to. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, everything is uh, swept away. Uh, the town halls, uh, city halls, and also it itself disappeared. And that's the one one reason uh, of why. Is, we have got so many difficulties in uh, securing the most basic human needs. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Leonard, could, could you talk about the crisis management? Uh, Japan is famous for being one of the most prepared countries or societies in the world, and yet it's, it's been a real struggle uh, in action for the last nearly two weeks. Can you talk about how you see it from a crisis management standpoint? Well, thank you, Christine, and, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for your interest in this, and let me express my sorrow and condolences to those involved uh, for the enormous loss of life and dislocation and suffering that this event has caused. Japan is famously one of the most prepared countries in the world for seismic events and tsunamis, and yet it's a struggle. It's a huge event. So, so why is that? Uh, the first and most important thing to notice about it is that Japan made enormous preparations for an event like this, and those preparations basically worked. Tens of thousands of lives were saved by what the Japanese people had done in advance in this event, to build buildings that would not fall down in the case of an event this size, to have people trained to move out of the way if there was a tsunami coming, and we should be, the first thing we should notice is the great success of those preparations. That's a, a very important thing. A second thing we need to notice is this is a, an unprecedentedly large event. This event was larger than the largest event that was predicted to be able to happen on that fault line. So it's an unexpectedly large event. All, all large events are unexpected, but, but this is beyond what was thought to be the limit uh, for, what, uh, for what these events could be. So it's not an event for which one could reasonably have been fully prepared. And in that context, I think 
we have to realize whenever an event exceeds our reasonable capacity, the results will be, will look messy and it will look like it, it, we would hope that we could be able to respond more quickly and more efficiently. Uh, I think we will find in the end, it's too early to say, no one can have an evaluation yet really of what the, what the response is, but I think we will in the end discover that the response has been very strong, very good, very effective. It's a, an extremely difficult response to make because at the same moment that you, your needs are sudden and large, much of the capacity that you were hoping to rely on has also been damaged or destroyed. Uh, as the Consul General observed, in some of these remote villages, the entire village is gone. So some of the response capability that you were hoping to be able to use for any kind of emergency event there has been destroyed by the same event that has created the need. So the gaps are huge, and in that context, we should expect something uh, you know, t not to look particularly pretty, but in the end, I think we will say the response was, was good. And basic human needs, needs are being met, uh, people are getting food and water, and so I think, in general, we should, we should stay focused on both the fact that the preparations worked and the response to date, as far as we can tell, uh, seems to be going well. Uh, Matt, Bon, um, the world has really been following and probably more aware than they ever thought they would be of how many reactors would be at Fukushima Daiichi, the six reactors. How, and again, now the radiation issues are kind of magnifying the concerns. Where are we in terms of, of in your opinion, getting control of it, and, and where does it go for here, from here? What are your biggest concerns right now? Well, I think we're in a much better place than we were a few days ago. Um, you know, they are getting power hooked back up uh, slowly but surely. They're working on getting some of the pumps uh, working. Uh, so I think the risk is reduced, but it isn't gone yet. It's still a very serious situation. We've got three reactors that still have the spent fuel exposed. We've got at least two spent fuel pools that have had a serious problem, probably have damaged uh, fuel in them. We don't really know uh, what the, how much of that fuel may still be uh, exposed. And it's going to take some days, maybe, uh, maybe some weeks yet, before we can say we've got all of the cooling in place in a stable way uh, that's going to last. I think the, the food and water contamination that we've seen so far does suggest there was a little bit more radiation release than we may have first uh, thought. But so far, what it's done is it's provoked a lot of fear uh, and not fatalities. I think we have to sort of draw back and say, the big picture here is that there's 10,000 and maybe as many as 20,000 people killed by the earthquake and tsunami. There's two people in the hospital from the nuclear power plant. Um, and that actually, as Dutch was saying, is kind of impressive if you think about the scale uh, of the event. These reactors shut down as they were supposed to. The uh, diesel generators came on and began generating power when the offsite power was lost, as they were supposed to. But then they got hit by the second punch, the tsunami that knocked out uh, the diesel generators. Going forward, thinking about the lessons, I think we need to look at possible one, two punches that might happen at other reactors, or for that matter, other facilities that have a lot of explosive or toxic uh, material in them, uh, and that might take out both the normal safety systems and the emergency backups, either by accident or by terrorists. I think in the nuclear space, we're much less well prepared around the world uh, to handle security incidents than we are uh, to handle safety incidents. I think we need to get spent fuel pools around the world into a, a safer place. For example, you can take the hot fuel assemblies and put a cool fuel assembly next to them so that there aren't places where there are a bunch of hot fuel assemblies that will heat each other up if the spent fuel is drained. Um, I think every country that operates these kinds of facilities now needs, in order to rebuild public confidence, an independent international review of the safety of their facilities and of their security. And I think moving forward beyond that, we need to strengthen the global regime that's intended to find and fix the least safe and the least secure facilities, because that regime is really quite weak today, and uh, I think this sends a pretty clear message that it needs to be strengthened. We'll come back to that, because I think there's a lot of issues, but 
Uh, turning to Professor Farr, can you talk about the leadership uh, in Japan on this? There's been uh, a sense of a crisis perhaps in leadership in addition to the obviously enormous crisis uh, triggered by these three uh, events. I think the judgment on how well, how well the Democratic Party of Japan <coughs> and the rest of Japan's leadership, including bureaucracy, have performed in this, it's going to take some time for voters to digest this because the crisis isn't over. Uh, there are still things that can go wrong. Uh, I think that you used the term earlier of the uh, complex mega disaster, and I think if you're have to, if you start looking at the issue of the performance of leadership, you have to break it down into the different parts of the disaster. If you look at just the part coming out of the earthquake and tsunami itself, that is the, research, the uh, rescue and recovery effort, uh, then I think actually the, the basically has done a pretty good job. Japan has done quite a good job. Uh, you have in other countries situations of people who aren't picked up in a timely fashion, uh, of uh, people who don't do their job and just run or whatever. This didn't happen. Public officials really made an all-out effort on the recovery, and I think the fact that now 2,500 people are in secure environments, uh, many in gyms or gymnasiums at schools or whatever, that's right. that's 250,000, a quarter yeah. million people, yeah are now in essentially safe havens is a testimony to how rapidly uh, and effectively uh, the government un under the leadership of the Democratic Party acted with the work of the bureaucrats. Uh, if you look beyond that, um, and by the way, in other countries too, there have been massive cover-ups of information. If anything, the problem in Japan is probably too much information is coming out in and out of and maybe perhaps a little too fast before it's really processed, but the information is out there. And time and time again, <clears throat> the chief cabinet minister has come to the microphone with updates to the point that he's become a kind of Twitter hero for sleep lit, for having been totally sleep deprived and so on. But there's a sense of, I think, of a government very, very responsive on these issues. Then when you move over to this whole other crisis that's the nuclear and radiation issue, then you move into an area that for political leadership, this is a stunningly difficult problem and it makes this so different from say the Kobe earthquake or Katrina or other crises that we could talk about. These are highly technical issues. Political leaders have had to come up to speed very rapidly to even understand them and to know at what point to intervene. And I think the government now quickly and readily and did in fact acknowledge that it should have moved more quickly, essentially, to take things over from TEPCO uh, when it was clear that the safety of the Japanese public was at stake. Uh, they've admitted that mistake, and since then, I think they're doing everything that they can conceivably do to get information out to the public about what is happening uh, in, a, in a timely fashion. On the radiation issue, I guess uh, I've been very impressed by the just incredible speed with which they're now testing every single kind of vegetable, every single marine product, water in every given environment to determine the, the degree to which there is a radioactivity problem. Uh, I think they've been faulted maybe for getting the information out before, for example, the information about uh, uh, water safety uh, for infants. Uh, came out uh, one day and then people said, well, but what about mothers? Well, they didn't have that information at that time probably and which would you like, what would you like them to do? Get information out quickly that could be of major consequences for public health or to wait until they're absolutely sure. We now know, by the way, that drinking water has been in the most recent tests, apparently the risk is not what they originally thought and it's apparently uh, under control and under the limits in Japan. But at any rate, overall stepping back, I think the, the uh, jury is not yet in on what the voters will judge that performance of political leaders to be, but in many ways I think they have been as responsive as they could be in an absolutely catastrophic situation. Well, what, one of the problems with uh, risk communication at the beginning of a disaster is you know it's sort of perception is reality and a lot of the perception is formed right at the beginning. So going back to those first kind of chaotic days, particularly as the nuclear 
situation was unfolding, and, and it just, as it seemed, it couldn't get worse, it would get worse. And it's not over. I, are there some lessons on the communication front there? Because I do think, uh, and maybe there's, it's the U.S. media that's been too critical, but you said there was too much information. I, I don't think there was too, there was not enough information about what was known and maybe too much communication. So that the, the two got mixed up, really. People, uh, in some cases, there would be kind of like a you know telephone game. So it did not seem that, that in terms of the nuclear situation, which I was following, that they had a plan for communication and getting the information. It, what's, th this also happened to Three Mile Island and one of the biggest criticisms, you know, Three Mile Island, the 1979 uh, nuclear accident in the US, one of the biggest criticisms was the way information was handled. Now, that was a three-day crisis and it was kind of over and this one is unfolding, but still those first three days. Um, did you see some lessons or anybody on the panel about the uh, communication uh, crisis at the beginning? And, and there was also this translation crisis to some degree because you, if anybody watched it, you can watch it on Ustream and you could watch it in real time and see the press conference, the translation, and some things lost in translation as it immediately went out on Twitter or other forms of communication. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the communications lessons? Because it has been mm -hmm. criticized and as you say, stepping back, the big picture may mm -hmm. change, but. Uh, well, it might be interesting what the others of you have to say. I think it will be, and there are many students in this room, this is gonna be a fascinating study of the actual who mm -hmm. knew what at what point mm -hmm. in time. When did TEPCO reach a judgment that it had tried every single option in terms of trying to cool down those reactors and those vent pools, and at what point should they have moved to putting in the seawater? That will be a fascinating question. The issue of relating to the international mm -hmm. people who cared about this issue and dealing with international media, I think is a, quite a separate issue. Uh, it's an important issue, and for people who work on media, that's going to be a big question to look at. But clearly, the communications internationally were very poor, particularly in the beginning. I think they've improved, but in the beginning, they were very well, And ineffective. I'm willing to blame the media as well, because again, media sounds singular, but there was an awful lot <laughs> going on in terms of communication, where everybody's a communicator now because of the ability to tweet and such. But any of the rest Listen, of you? I think Susan yeah. makes a really important point about the technical complexity of what the leaders were trying to get on top of. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt can tell us better than anybody, uh, this is an incredibly complex piece of machinery and the dynamics and physics of it are very difficult to understand in the best of times. And the key thing to notice is, again, unprecedented event, bigger event than had been planned for. Uh, people have uh, suggested, a, an expert that I work with in Japan says this is a, roughly a 1,000 year recurrence event. So this is way beyond what the plants were directly designed for. And as a result, they sustained damage. And the first and most important thing to notice about the information is that even the experts on the site don't fully understand what has happened. They don't have the information. They don't have a, a clear picture of the, way, of the state in which these reactors are operating. Now, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It, the sense in which that's a, a defense is that that's why the information keeps changing because nobody really fully understands this and they're finding out as they go along. Um, so I, my interpretation, it's a, it's a generous interpretation, but my interpretation is nobody was trying to hide anything. It's they didn't know and they were revealing what they best understood at the time, but that's been rapidly evolving. But the downside of that recognition is that, think about that for a second, even the experts in the plant don't fully know what's happened to those reactors and therefore don't fully understand the state in which they're trying to operate. And yet, still flying somewhat blind, they have to try to, to bring these you know, to a, a safe landing. Uh, that is a scary thing. That's the residual risk that Matt is, is describing, that it looks like we're headed in the right direction towards stabilization, but it's a little, it's hard to be completely confident about. So I, I think one of the things that I would fault in the overall communication and media maelstrom that's been going on is the lack of making the point that Dutch just made, that uh, people sort of said, well, the pressure is this, you know, the water level is this, and they weren't really saying, we don't know 
this. We don't know that. I mean, the reality is right now, if you were to list the top 10 things you would like to know to assess the remaining risk, I would say eight or nine of those, we just don't know the answer. Uh, and so there's a lot more that we don't know than that we do know that's important to assessing this risk. And I think people have been too unwilling to admit that on television, uh, both the Japanese officials, but also all of us experts and pundits who have been on TV <laughs> have been expressing a lot more certainty than, than actually exists. Yes, uh, I sense that this time the, uh, the authority in Tokyo, uh, the government and the other companies uh, included, are really trying to be as transparent as possible and try to provide the, all the information which are available and, uh, and not try to, to hide that there are a lot of important missing pieces. And, and I think that was good and uh, uh, this time the that kind of information activity was really testing because uh, not like in the past, we have got a pan parallel channel of inf uh, uh, information, which is uh, uh, internet and uh, social network, Twitter, et cetera. And there are a lot of information circulating in that channel and uh, always the government or the TEPCO has to, to compete in, right. in a sense with this flow of information. And uh, the fact that uh, the, the chief cabinet of uh, 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 the, excuse me, uh, pr premier chief cabinet Edano has got a good mark in that circle on Twitter uh, shows that uh, we can say that uh, we, relatively, we did a relatively good job. Although having, having listened to it, I think uh, both the information generated uh, and the media uh, there was not as much context and certainly as you say both the expert and the electronic media we did not have enough people who were competent to really talk about uh, nuclear disaster I mean there's been a sense of maybe too much complacency the last major comparable thing Chernobyl in 1986 I mean how prepared did you feel that uh, they were for this disaster on the nuclear front. So again, I, I just want to pick up on what Matt said because uh, he used a description that we is, is similar to something we often say in talking about crisis management. Um, you said there was a list of things that you'd like to know. We call that situational awareness. It's a relatively small list. If you know these things, then you have a reasonable grasp of what's going on. So what, what Matt is observing is we don't have situational awareness. The experts do not have situational awareness of the state of these reactors. Now, in that state, I will just observe to you, a common pattern is that experts are overconfident in that setting. They're overconfident that they, under, they do understand. They think they understand when they don't. And they're overconfident that they know how things are going to behave. They're overconfident in their predictions that, well, okay, we think it's roughly like this, and so if we do this, that will fix it. So there, there's a, we call this Crow's rule. It's based on a, a rule that was articulated by a, a, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of the U.S. in, a, in the midst of a terrible event. Crow's rule is that 80% of the information that you get from a new bad situation on the first day will be wrong. You just don't know which 80% it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the, and, and that's part of what we're living through. And part of it is, it's not that the experts, it's not that the people who are on the scene are, tr are lying to you. That might be true. You know, we'll, we'll find out if that was true. But it, it, might, it might be true. But, but even if they are trying to tell you the truth, they don't know the truth. And, but they think they do. They're overconfident. And so that's part of what we're living through is the revealing of the, gosh, you know, that was a surprise to us, and here's another surprise to us. And, and that, that's, on the one hand, I think that explains a lot of what we've seen. On the other hand, it's also why we should be nervous. Not, not terrified, but nervous, uh, that there are other things that we also don't know in this setting. The, the other thing I would draw attention to, it, it does come back to the media point, Christine, is that I think a lot of the information that you see was accurately reported, this is what people are telling us and this is what we understand to be true, but misunderstood and then re-reported. So people, for example, have completely conflated ter one term, meltdown, as meaning a whole range of different things. Meltdown applies to a single fuel rod getting above the temperature that it's supposed to be at and having a minor uh, event within that one fuel rod. That's a meltdown. All the way to, and people have heard that, and then interpreted that as a total breach of containment and a release of high-level radioactivity, which is a nuclear catastrophe beyond Chernobyl. Well, 
and, and that and people have been unable to distinguish where we were on that spectrum. But that that was again the first couple of days meltdown. Uh, it wasn't a context that it. Right. What was the containment situation? Right. And again, there was a breakdown in communication starting from right. the experts to the lay media. I think. But I, let's I do think it's important to realize how different this is from Chernobyl. I mean, Chernobyl released about a third of the cesium-137 in the core, something like half of the iodine in the core. As far, and there's, you know, there are huge areas that are uninhabitable to this day. As far as we know so far, knock on wood, this is much more than a thousand times less uh, in the release. Uh, again, there's a couple of people in the hospital who got directly exposed inside the reactor. There's uh, quite a few people who have been evacuated, but my guess, again, knock on wood, within weeks, probably those people will be able to go home. And so this is really, I mean, it, it's worse than Three Mile Island, but it's so dramatically better than Chernobyl uh, so far. And you really need to keep that in context. Well, and that's that time perspective, because Three Mile Island, it was only after that people were able to study it for years and discover that not that much radiation was released right. and there were not long-term health effects. But can, can we just do a couple of the global issues before we open it up? Uh, nuclear power, both uh, in Japan, where it's 30% of energy and where in countries like the US, it, there, were talk, there was talk maybe uh, too optimistically of a nuclear renaissance and the possibility of nuclear power playing a larger role. What's your sense? Uh, any of you, but Matt, to start about the implications for kind of nuclear uh, power going forward. Well, I think it will vary a lot. in the U.S., let's say. Yeah, I think it will vary a lot by country. Uh, so China is building more nuclear power plants than any other country in the world, and I think they'll keep going. Um, I think a number of other countries will keep going. Um, I think in the United States it was already, for completely economic reasons, unlikely we were going to have many nuclear power plants get built. When you have gas, at, uh, natural gas at $4 uh, a million cubic feet and no carbon price, it makes no sense to build nuclear power plants at the cost that they are today. Um, and I think what this will do will be to reinforce public nervousness, reinforce investor nervousness, uh, and probably lead to somewhat tighter regulations that will then introduce probably additional delays in costs. So when I look at it, I think there will probably still be nuclear growth around the world, but I, th I now unfortunately believe that it's quite unlikely that we will see the scale, the huge scale of nuclear growth that would be necessary for nuclear to be an important part of the answer to mitigating climate change. Uh, and I, I, think that's, I think that's unfortunate, but it may well have been a casualty of this particular accident. Could we, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just want to pick up on the point about climate change because the focus in all these discussions now is about the inherent risk of nuclear power and all energy forms have all kinds of consequences. Uh, but with nuclear, Japan ba basically has uh, made a major commitment to deal with climate change and nuclear energy has been a very important part of their solution. And uh, I, my personal belief is this, unless there's something that happens from now that is out of, far beyond what we've seen so far, that there will be a flurry of uh, retrofitting and bringing things up to very high standards, but that nuclear power will continue to be an important part of Japan's way of dealing with its energy. If, if we move briefly beyond <coughs> nuclear, just to the economic impact, um, perhaps can, the Can I just say one yeah. other thing about the, the nuclear issue just before we do that? Um, I share Matt's prediction and uh, Susan's judgment about this. Um, Matt's prediction is that w we will reevaluate, we'll probably spend a lot of money on trying to retrofit nuclear plants. I'll bet if you live in France right now, you're pretty nervous about this since you 70% of your reliance is on nuclear. Uh, I think, in general, much of that fear is misplaced. Uh, I think we could still safely build nuclear power plants. There's some design issues we ought to look at here. How 13 diesel generators all got taken out by the same tsunami. This is what we call a common mode failure. Okay, so that we manage, we have a backup system, but all of the different backup systems or different elements of that backup system were subject to the same risk. That's a design error. 
that's just a mistake in how you, uh, we've made that mistake before, we can maybe fix it by looking more carefully for it. Now the other aspect of design I think we're gonna see people work on is passive versus active. Um, the issue is that nuclear plants, as they are mostly currently designed, save I think one that's currently uh, operating in China, uh, require, they always generate heat. And the question is whether you can cool them. But the cooling requires an active intervention. It requires a system that is working. What you would hope for is the, a design in which, if, even if you had continuous heat, the cooling would take care of itself in, even if you didn't do anything, if you, even if you just sat there. So if you could design, that would, that would in, improve the safety. My one concern, actually, is the facts that have been emerging more recently about the size of this event relative to the predictions. The prediction was that they could not have an earthquake higher than an 8.0 magnitude on this fault line. I don't know if you've been paying attention to this, but we have all the same assurances about California, that the largest maximum event we can get in California is about 8.0. Now, if that is it called into question by uh, this error in, in uh, analysis, then one wonders how many more nuclear power plants you want to build in California. Well, I think we can feel assured that that's going to be uh, <laughs> examined, <probably> <laughs> um, both the existing ones and future. But before we open this up, perhaps we could hear from the Consul General on the larger economic ripple effect of this, given the size of the Japanese economy and the importance of it is. Uh, yes, the, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, effects, various effects of, of this devastation. On the macroeconomic side, of course, the uh, in the effect is very important. Uh, the, the, uh, the according to the very re recent estimate, uh, the losses caused by this earthquake and tsunami uh, amount up to something like 200 or 300 billion. So it's uh, more or less double uh, what we have experienced uh, experienced in 1995 by Hansing earthquake, and. Uh, Th that is a macroeconomic effect. And there is a lot of uh, structure uh, effect because we are in a globalized world. We have got all supply chains, uh, not only in, within Japan, but within Asia and within uh, the, the, the world market. Uh, so what we are going to see is what will be the shift of these, uh, these chains, supply chains, uh, to what direction, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, Japanese makers are supplying, uh, Japanese car parts makers supplying car parts, uh, auto parts, not only for Japanese uh, makers, but for, for GM, for instance, right. or, or, or French or German uh, car makers, or the other, other things like uh, uh, electric parts, or uh, parts of air, uh, air, aircraft engines, etc. They are all within the global chain. So, so there would be a, a, a much more uh, important effect than uh, the macroeconomic effect within Japan. Okay, I think we're going to open it up to questions. And um, I know you've heard this before if you've been to the forum. Uh, would you please identify yourself? Uh, will you make it very brief and not a, a statement? And remember that a question ends with a question mark. So. Uh, there's a lot of issues to cover. We've got an excellent panel. So if, um, does anyone have a question to start? Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Denman. I am a recent graduate, a PhD out of the Nuclear Engineering Department at MIT. My question was on the, uh, the comment that was made about whether or not we should build reactors in California because there's a potential for a massive earthquake that, that could cause damage. Uh, nuclear power, of course, isn't the only industrial technology that could cause uh, damage to health and human life. Uh, do you propose not building basically anything in California? Or uh, is nuclear treated speci uh, special in this case? Um, actually, I agree with you that there are many other technologies one ought to also to examine. Uh, I've, my observation is simply, it's not so much the risk of catastrophic loss, it's the risk of the plants uh, from being damaged. What's happened in this, these plants are basically going to have to be written off 
as economic assets, partly because of the damage to them, partly because of the meltdown, partly because of they've now used seawater in the tanks. So uh, the same is true of Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island had what should have been a relatively minor accident, but it resulted in the meltdown of much of the core and the total loss of that plant, which is a billion dollar, at the time, billion dollar investment. So my only observation is one ought to be careful about what assets one exposes to seismic risk. And if you're gonna build nuclear power plants, California might not be the best place. Uh, but I'm not against nuclear power. I, I, I share Matt's prediction. I'm afraid that we are going to significantly reduce uh, our investment and our growth in that industry. And I think that's probably a mistake. I think there, the risks are overstated in general. And specifically, the seismic risks are overstated. I mean, notice, this is an unprecedented 1,000-year event. And these plants are, you know, we've had some modest breach of containment. But basically, the designs are saving us. And I think that ought to be, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to say in, the moment, in this moment. But uh, that actually ought to be improving our confidence rather than undercutting it. Although, Matt, you, you had an opinion piece about things that could be done right now in terms of the spent fuel yeah. and things in which there were warnings from the National Academy and of Sciences and others five years ago. So there is always the question of, of why some of these warnings were not taken and obviously if not uh, now when, but w what's your sense of well, I do think that's true. I think uh, one of the most interesting questions coming out of this whole thing, which is, as the questioner points out, not just for the nuclear industry, but for every industry that has, you know, large concentrations of either explosive, explosive or toxic materials or whatever, is how do you structure organizations so that people will push for the safety improvements right. and will look, ask the hard questions uh, and so on, and, and, and not fall into a state of complacency where they sort of accept risk as, as the you know, engineers in the lead up to the Challenger accident uh, were doing. And, and that's it's hard to do, and I think my guess is it's the ways to do it probably vary a bit with national <coughs> culture and the ways different national cultures uh, work with these kinds of things. So it, I think it's a, a big challenge. One key item, I think, is making sure that relevant organizations have sort of a red team who's paid to ask those hard questions all the time. Uh, but drawing back, I think the key question the questioner is asking is a good one, which is compared to what, right? And in particular with energy, um, you know, if we're not gonna be building nuclear plants, we're gonna be building something else. And every energy source has its risks, has its costs, has its downsides, and you have to balance these things. Coal in particular, I mean, there are thousands of people in the United States who die from coal every year without fail. Year in, year out, thousands of people are That's killed. That's not a risk, it's a fact. It's a, not a risk, it's a fact. But there, you know, one here and one there, and you never know that that was the particular person that was killed because of that particular plant. Um, and so we sort of live with that. You know, there's tens of thousands of people killed in car accidents every year, and you sort of come to live with that because of the convenience that we get from using our cars. Uh, so I do think we need to have some context and balance when we're thinking about uh, nuclear, because it really, you do have to think compared to what. So I think it means you have to focus on, on risks and risk management, but it also means you've got to focus on the right risk. As you said before, the big risk with regard to nuclear is not seismic events at the plants, it's security events with the fuel before, during, and after. Well, what, one of the problems is, get, is getting big thinkers that can do these trade-offs, because again, we tend to also talk about them event by event, and that larger perspective is pretty hard to come by even from the experts. But, but that's why we have a Kennedy School. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's why we've got the, the next one on uh, risk trade-offs in energy. Uh, question here. Yeah, I'm Neil Hurley from Boston. I'm an oil and gas uh, geologist. Know a lot about faults and things. But uh, for, <coughs> for Dr. Bunn, I had a question. Uh, you know, one of the downsides of nuclear power is the spent fuel. And uh, it's curious, you know, why there was spent fuel at this location. And then how, do, uh, how does the nuclear industry get rid of spent fuel and Japan in particular? 
Well, there, there isn't a way to get rid and of it. And in the U.S. as right. well. You can so get rid of it. You can only move it. There, there isn't a way to get rid of it. Uh, you can process it in a variety of ways, uh, or you can put it in uh, pools. You can put it in dry casks. So when it first comes out of the reactor, it's so hot, you have to keep it in a, a, a liquid pool to keep it cool. After about five years or so, it's cooled off enough that you could put it in a dry cask. And I think we need to be doing more of that. We need to be relying less on letting it pile up and pile up and pile up in these pools and more on putting it into these dry casks, which are big concrete steel. It just sits there absolutely still. It can be there for decades while we work on figuring out what the heck we're going to do with this <laughs> in the long term. Now, in Japan, the plan is to reprocess uh, the nuclear fuel. They have a large plant at Rakasho. Uh, it's turned out to be uh, an extraordinarily expensive uh, proposition. In fact, the, the utilities finally went to the government and said, uh, this is hurting our credit ratings, and they demanded and got a bailout in the form of a, a charge for every user of electricity in Japan just to pay for that uh, reprocessing plant. It's much cheaper just to put it in the dry casks for the time being. And the reprocessing doesn't really solve the problem because what it does is it takes the spent fuel and it divides it into two or three pieces, the plutonium, the really radioactive high-level waste, the uranium, uh, but then you still have to figure out what to do with the radioactive high-level waste. Mm -hmm. In the United States, our plan had been to dispose of it in Yucca Mountain. Uh, President Obama canceled that. Uh, there's now a blue ribbon commission looking into what we should do. Um, we don't know what they're going to recommend. I strongly suspect they're going to, one of the things they're going to recommend is an institutional change to take it out of the Department of Energy and out of a situation where for decades the reactors have been paying money every year to the government to take care of the spent fuel and the government has A, not been taking care of the spent fuel and B, spending the money on other things. <laughs> um, so we have in effect been stealing money from the ratepayers. Um, uh, so I think the Blue Ribbon Commission is likely to recommend that we change that. But there is some hope in the sense that there are now two countries, Finland and Sweden, who have not only found places to put their nuclear waste, but found them with the support of the local communities. And in fact, in Finland, the community that didn't get the nuclear waste dump sued. <laughs> uh, uh, which is an interesting story. It raised the question in my mind of whether they'd like to have some of ours. But, uh, yeah. I don't think the answer to that is yes, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, so how, how I think. How much are the dry uh, storage casks being used? The dry storage casks are being used increasingly as these pools get filled, but I would like to see these pools not be as stuffed as they are, because if you have more space between each spent fuel assembly, then if you did have some problem with a loss of water in the pool, it would be harder for the assemblies to heat up enough to cause a problem. Yes, up there. Hi, my name is Ibrahim Khan. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, I want to begin by thanking all of you for being here, discussing this very important issue. Um, my question relates to Japan and specifically the way the country satisfies its energy needs. Um, in the long term, uh, do you experts see that Japan will have a change in the way it satisfies its energy needs, or will there just be a more um, careful approach to where these um, reactors and plants are placed? As you know, the uh, more than 10% of the uh, primary energy supply in Japan is by uh, the nuclear power, and more than 30% of the electricity is covered by the nuclear plant. And, uh, as a country uh, which clearly lack, uh, lacking in natural resources, uh, it is an indispensable option. So uh, to my mind, uh, it's uh, my personal opinion, uh, this is not a question of whether or not go nuclear, but uh, uh, how, how we can keep this uh, uh, indispensable option uh, taking uh, the lessons, uh, uh, best lessons possible out of this devastation and uh, uh, to, to, to have a more uh, secure uh, systems and uh, maybe better regulations, regulations et cetera, and also to, to convince people, public opinion, which, uh, which have been obviously much more uh, uh, have got a much more sensitivity vis-a-vis -vis nuclear things, but uh, it's an inevitable option. I would just like to comment that um, 
in the oil crisis back in the 1970s, Japan learned uh, the lesson it took from that crisis, uh, in which there was a, basically a, a difficulty getting oil from the Middle East, which was to diversify its types of energy sources, including now a great deal of experimentation in Japan on uh, renewable forms of energy. Uh, but I think in the overall uh, array of things, nuclear will continue to have, uh, have a, a certainly a part, but there's not going to be a reversion, say, to more dependence on, say, oil in the Middle East or some formula like that, because diversification is the best, uh, I think, answer for a resource-dependent nation. If I had to guess, though, I would guess that the next few plants will be significantly slowed compared to what might otherwise have been the case. Hello, um, my name is Alice Shang, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, I first wanted to thank you all again for being with us this evening. Um, and my question was, um, I guess, what do you feel um, the recovery effort in Japan will be or should be like in the years to come? In particular, in the areas um, that you mentioned that were completely wiped out by the earthquake or the tsunami, um, do you feel that these areas will primarily be rebuilt as they were to be what they were before, rebuilt under a new model, or will the citizens of these areas simply be relocated to other cities, and um, will that be the primary effort going forward? I'll just, I'll just comment. Uh, many, as we know, many of the people who were affected by the uh, tsunami and, and earthquake were are very old elderly people, and I think this is going to be a huge challenge of Japan. I think it's also true that they have come from communities with dense social networks, high in social capital. And uh, there's a, a book that's coming out from Daniel Aldrich, uh, a faculty member, in a professor in political science, that shows that when you look at how communities recover, the single best predictor, predictor of recovery is pre-existing social networks. Yep. Uh, and it's much more important than, for example, the uh, degree to which there was a disaster or the socioeconomic standing of the people affected. So my guess is that people will seek each other out, even in communities that were diminished in numbers, they will find each other and they will, they will probably want to locate as near as possible to where they were before. I could be wrong about that, but I think based on the way people normally have in the situations, and I did, I paid a visit to Aceh, Indonesia at one point, looking at the rebuilding at the tsunami. People may go away for a while, but they tend to come back to the area that they know best, even if they're not dependent on their livelihood from like fishing, for example. So, uh, I think there's some, it's a great question and a really important one. And we're moving soon, hopefully we're stabilizing the nuclear situation, we're moving soon to the, it's all about recovery. And we do know some things empirically from other large scale events. Uh, first of all, we know Japan is very good at risk management. We know that from the fact that they did such effective preparation in advance. We also know from a cultural perspective that the Japanese have a long history of resilience. And resilience is the buzzword now that's being used as the basis for recovery. So how, how resilient is the population? I, I predict that the Japanese uh, population will be very resilient, culturally dedicated, uh, the, the sense of acceptance without defeat is really important. So we accept that this has happened and it's a terrible thing, but we're not defeated by it. We're going to go on. We're going to rebuild. Empirically, people want to build back what they had before. Almost always this turns out to be, in detail, impossible. It also often turns out to be unwise because often you've, what you've learned is that where they built before was risky for one reason or another. You've now had that revealed to you. Now, maybe if it's a thousand-year event, you don't worry about that. You let uh, seven generations from now, they can worry about it. But I'm going to guess that this is going to be a struggle, uh, that on the one hand, the population will be very resilient, will be willing to bear the burden and to rebuild and to go forward, uh, but that people will want to rebuild as it was before, and that rarely turns out to be possible in detail, to build the community just the way it was before. But as Susan said, the critical feature that determines the effectiveness of response or, or of recovery is the social network and the, the local leadership. And there are some places, it, some villages where that was completely destroyed. So we remain to see what happens there. But I predict that people will want to go back where they were and that they will, uh, in spite of, of other people's sense that they should probably 
relocate to somewhere else, uh, much of it w they will go back to where they were. Yeah, one, yeah, one thing, uh, after the Kobe earthquake, one of the extraordinary uh, things that followed that was a real burst of volunteerism in Japan and mm -hmm. the development of many, many mm -hmm. NGOs that were helping the people who were affected by the earthquake. I think the people, in particular the elderly people who were affected by this uh, earthquake and tsunami are going to need a lot of support services, I mean, counseling and all kinds of help to to find their lives again. And I think that probably, uh, hopefully, there will be uh, a lot of NGO activity directed at that effort in Japan in providing support to them. Can I just comment on that? Because I think that's a really important point. On the one hand, the resilient culture is a huge asset, a huge strength. But if what it means is that individuals feel that they have to bear the burden themselves, they can't ask for help, they have to bear it alone, that's not healthy. And so we, we know that after very large events, there is an epidemic, an often undiagnosed epidemic, of post-traumatic stress. And that is something that people need to be attentive to, and we need to recognize that as a real issue. We need to diagnose it much more effectively than we have, and we need to, to respond to it and treat it. Uh, and it's a perfectly natural consequence of living through an incredibly traumatic event like this. So that's something, uh, it, that, that's the, the potential downside to, be, to trying to be too resilient and to trying to carry it alone. So and I hope that. Perhaps the Consul General could address kind of we're, we're at the end of two weeks. In the kind of next couple of months, what do you see as the biggest priorities for the initial recovery? Not the long term, but kind of the short to uh, middle term. Um, uh, before answering that question, let me uh, add uh, what, on what has been said about the uh, uh, about th that question. Uh, one important element is that the, that area, Tohoku area, is an uh, uh, area where the a sense of community remains much more stronger than in, in other parts of uh, Japan, like, not like in Tokyo. And uh, this, uh, the people there have shown a particularly strong sense of unity uh, when they are faced with crisis. So that would contribute to, uh, uh, to, re to restore the, the, the community once the, all these uh, uh, physical difficulties are settled. And the, uh, the challenges that we are going to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to be faced in the coming months rather than weeks uh, will be, of course, uh, after the, this first emergency stage, how to restore, how to restore the, the system, how to restore the economy, how, how to restore the infrastructure, etc. And uh, uh, we are going to have a, a, a really, we should have a concentrated effort for that purpose. Uh, already the government uh, is planning to, 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 to prepare a, a supplementary budget, and uh, we are going to have a, a, a national uh, rehabilitation agency, a new agency to, to coordinate all the efforts uh, uh, throughout the government. But uh, it will be a very uh, daunting task for us. Hello, uh, my name is Cormac, uh, Cormac Rafferty. I'm a physicist from Ireland. I'm spending a year here with uh, Sheila Jasanoff's group on science, technology, and society at Harvard. Question: um, here, Here's my uh, at Harvard. Uh, here's my question. Um, while I agree in, on, on, on the whole with the panel, I mean I, I do agree that in in a way, the long-term fallout, if I may use the word, will be a slowdown in countries like Ireland and Germany that are seriously considering building reactors, and I think that has very important implications, particularly for countries that don't have, uh, let's say, too many things in the basket as far as uh, renewable energy is concerned. You know, it's, it's a very important factor. But I, I still feel, you know, as a physicist myself, I, I feel the nuclear industry, I mean, there's something there that has to be, you know, absolutely tackled head on. And the basic question that is being asked by so many people is, you know, can humans build a nuclear reactor which is accident proof? And I know you'd immediately say, well, can anyone build anything that's accident proof? But of course, radiation is a, a special case. And I, I think in tackling that question, I'd ask Matt and also the others, I mean, we do have to bear in mind that number one, I mean, these events are extremely tragic, but they're not unrelated. It's not a confluence of, you know, a coincidence of different factors. A very large earthquake will, you know, you may expect a very large tsunami, and from that you would expect anything above ground to be at risk, in particular backup systems. So, you know, I, I, I'm very surprised 
as a lot of people were after the fact, that the backup generators were above ground in the first place. I, I'd love to hear from Matt why that is. I just, I don't understand how that, a basic design flaw, because that could show up, as you know, as a problem in all sorts of different, diff different conditions. So that, that, that's sort of my, ma my major question. How can, you know, rather than us, can something like that happen? And the other part of the answer I, I would like to put is, it's also very relevant that even in the case of Chernobyl, if I remember rightly, they were actually trying to test this sort of thing when the dreadful accident happened. And that's the problem, isn't it? You can never test what happens when you remove those control rods. So in a sense, there is a great unknown there. And even as it is today, one last thing I just want to add in the answer, we don't actually know the effects yet because a great many of those workers were exposed. And it may be several years before we know the effects on them. But generally speaking, I think, what I'm trying to get across is I think the concern of the public to me is quite understandable because it is the old thing of this was one accident that nature threw at us, but there are, there are lots of different possibilities. Right, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and there's a number of different questions embedded in, in what you just said. So one question was, can we design things that are absolutely safe? No, we can't design things that are absolutely safe. Can we design things that are a heck of a lot safer than this particular reactor design that was developed 50 years ago and built 40 years ago, yes. Uh, in particular, um, one thing that uh, colleagues from the Kachatov Institute in Moscow and I uh, were talking about in a report we issued last fall is the concept of small modular reactors that might be built in factories. And um, one of the potential advantages of these is that with a lot less energy in the core, it makes it much simpler to design it, as Dutch was saying, in a way that's essentially walk away safe, where if you lose all cooling for some reason for an extended period of time, it still doesn't melt down. Uh, and I think that, you know, assuming you can develop uh, reactors of that kind at reasonable cost, which is the question now, um, I think that would be a major step forward. But as uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover once said, uh, a paper reactor will beat a real reactor every time. And these are, <laughs> at this point, uh, mm. uh, paper reactors. Um, although they're, some of them are closely based on, on the naval reactors, which are very, very real reactors. Um, I think the other question you raise is, you know, uh, why were the diesel generators arranged the way they were? And actually, I was. Just the other day, I had a cab driver ask me, you know, why didn't they put the diesel generators up high? And you know, in retrospect, a totally obvious question. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily fault them. They did have a 22-foot high seawall. Problem was, they had a 30-foot tsunami. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what's interesting to me is this reactor had been operating for 40 years. It had hundreds of inspections. Nobody and presumably ever nobody ever asked the question that that cab driver asked, or if they asked it, they never pushed it. And so to me, the interesting question is, at facilities all over the world, are there questions like that that either haven't been asked or haven't been pushed? And how do we structure institutions so that those questions do get asked before something terrible happens? Um, and, and, and how do we motivate people to, to be willing to be the guy who says, I'm, even though everybody else is telling me it's fine, I'm gonna make a stink about this. Because it's not a comfortable position to be in. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's an interesting institutional question that Dutch would know more about than I, how to, how to motivate those kinds of questions to be asked. It's a great question, and it's, in part, it's a great engineering problem. Uh, we've seen this uh, many times before, as I observed earlier. For example, about three years after we started flying DC-10s, a DC-10 had a depressurization event with a door and crashed. And people tried to figure out why would a depressurization event with a door crash the plane? Well, it turns out they had three backup hydraulic systems on the plane. All three of them, the pipes for all three of them, went past this door. So when the bo door blew out, it took out all three of the hydraulic systems on the plane. So that's what we call a common mode failure. And so we got 13 diesel generators all taken out by the same event, three hydraulic systems on the DC-10. That's an engineering problem. It's just a design issue. It's much more convenient to put the diesel generators all in the same place because you can maintain them, you can fuel them, you can know where they are, you don't have to have them scattered here, hither and yon. But as it turns out, they are then all subject to the same risks. Now the problem is nature has a way of exposing to us 
the weaknesses that we hadn't thought of. So this is a great spur to ingenuity. We need to be more ingenious and try to think our way through those things and try to build systems that are more robust. But and we also need, as, as Matt says, you need the incentive to do that. You need so the, the leadership gonna, pressure and, to do that. And, and right, terrorists have even more and, and tendency and, uh, to pick right, out exactly. the weak points. Because right. they, they're they're specifically the, the earthquake them. won't intentionally hit the reactor that's most vulnerable to it, but the terrorists will. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very good point. Very good. All right, Susan, quickly. Just, uh, <laughs> I, I feel awkward bringing in politics and the Kennedy School, but there's a political, you know, there's a political it is the reality. Of politics <laughs> you know, there is a political reality here, which is that there will always be people with technical skills who will see the virtue of upgrades of all kinds in terms of safety of all kinds of things from highways to nuclear power plants. But where is the domestic constituency for that? And meanwhile, their domestic constituency is pushing for all kinds of other things. We ask that our politicians be responsive to pressures, and they are not going to be responsive. Basically, the people who push for incremental improvements in safety are at the back of the line in terms of the political clout that they have. Uh, all right, we're going to move on, although I, maybe the one uh, encouraging message of the question and your answer is that the, the wisdom of the common cab driver, This is there's been a success in... Uh, information being transmitted were actually <laughs> maybe really technical, but the cab drivers are asking some of the same questions that the technical. But they're among experts. the best informed. I mean, <laughs> we, we all know that. Um, can we go up there? Hi. Hey, my name is Joel Sanchez. I'm an undergraduate. Um, as it was mentioned before, um, there were many crisis mitigation arrangements that um, Japan had that could explain why only 25,000 people died compared to Haiti where more than 100,000 people die. What are the crisis mitigation arrangements that countries like Dominican Republic and other developing countries can imitate to um, make sure that um, the death toll doesn't um, get as high as, as Haiti? Right. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, everybody can do is uh, that uh, after the, the 1923 uh, big earthquake, uh, we have introduced uh, 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 a week of uh, disaster preparedness, uh, first, uh, first week of uh, September. And uh, on that particular week, uh, the uh, nationwide, uh, the all the uh, students, all the kids are, are called to, to, to practice how to, how to, to, how to, to for instance, evacuate themselves, or how to, how to cover yourself when the earthquake happened, et cetera. And uh, th this worked. This worked to, to reduce the number of deaths uh, pretty well. And uh, that kind of uh, repeated training uh, is, uh, is everybody can do under the, 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 the we pay. I think that's just a terrific question. And let me distinguish Haiti and Japan briefly. The way we characterize this is to observe that the event that happened in Haiti was not in the lifetime memory of anyone now alive. We had not had a major seismic event in Haiti for 250 years. So there was no memory of any real risk associated with building unreinforced masonry buildings. So concrete's relatively cheap. You know, you pour it, you can build buildings five, six stories high. There were many of those in Port-au-Prince. You had an earthquake that happened to happen in the highest density population zone in the country with about a million people directly exposed to it, uh, very close to the center of population with many unreinforced masonry buildings, basically because we had had no seismic events to speak of in 250 years and nobody was worried about it. So the problem that Haiti illustrates is how you prepare against the event that you haven't seen before and haven't thought of. Japan, by contrast, has regular large seismic events. The Kobe earthquake, the 1923 Kanto earthquake, the, they've had very large events. And so it is well within the lifetime memory of many millions of people now alive in Japan to be prepared. Same is true of Chile. Chile had a, a, a seismic event immediately after Haiti. The Haiti event was a 7.0 earthquake. That's not a very big earthquake. It killed 300,000 people in the first 20 minutes. In Chile, they had a earthquake which was 30 times more powerful than that. And it, they had about 1,000 lives lost from it. Now that's a tragedy. But it's a tragedy of a whole different scale in terms of lives lost. Why? Chile, they have regular seismic events. So the ones we, the, the ones we see, we call this not in my lifetime. The ones we see in our lifetime or the lifetimes of our grandparents, we prepare against those. We don't, we're not perfect. We can get better about that. We can get better 
engineering and better motivation and better political leadership, we can do better. And that, we're dedicated to trying to figure out how to do better. But the ones that we see regularly, we, we do generally try to address. It's the ones that hadn't occurred to us that might happen, those are the ones that are really hard. This is the black swan problem. And what we need, I think, to help us prepare for that is greater robustness, less complexity, or, le or more ability to isolate these complex systems. And the, the final thing we need is greater ingenuity in thinking about what the risks might be. Now, I think uh, Professor Farr is on sabbatical um, uh, this year, and she had uh, retreated to New Zealand. Uh, maybe you could share your own experience yeah. on, on another recent uh, Oh, well, Were you there? No, I, I was actually on a 19-day trip to, um, to New Zealand, and on day five, uh, there was the earthquake in Christchurch. And so uh, we're today on, I think, 13th day after the earthquake in Japan, and I watched basically the news coverage for 12 days, uh, really a comparable time period in Christchurch. And what I was so struck by is the response in the Christchurch case seemed to me just a model of response. The prime minister and the mayor worked side by side in making announcements that were clear. Regular information came out. Uh, people were quickly relocated uh, to places. There was a, a, a rescue effort that involved teams from over 60 countries. And so all of that happened. Uh, but then when the earthquake occurred in Japan, I began to see how the challenge in Japan was of just an entirely different magnitude. There was no equivalent to the mayor in Christchurch because local officials had literally been swept out to sea in many cases. Uh, it was not confined to, in Japan's case, to one city. We have an entire coastal area involving, involving multiple prefectures that were affected by this. And of course, the actual amount of devastation was absolutely so much um, more huge. So uh, I was realizing that uh, the, ch the challenge in Japan is simply been on a totally different order. The scale. Christ, yeah. Christ Church was a, a terrible event mm -hmm. and a, a couple hundred people lost their lives in it. It was a 6.3 earthquake. That is about 10,000 times less energy than the energy that was released in the Japan earthquake. Mm -hmm. 10,000 times less. We have the next Hi, I'm Philip Harris. I'm a Cambridge resident and also the co-chair of the Cambridge Scuba Sister City Committee. Um, we are a small volunteer organization and many of the people who are fundraising in the city now, they're doing things for, you know, immediately get money to Japan, but because we're small, our focus, I feel, should be on the next phase in terms of the recovery. So I guess the question is based on some of the things you've seen in Indonesia, Haiti, an organization like us, what advice would you have for us in terms of where we should focus our energy in helping the people? Um, Scuba was relatively safe. They're north of Tokyo, and their big issue now is dealing with refugees coming from Sendai. They have a few camps set up, and people are volunteering there. But, I mean, we're 8,000 miles away, so the question is, what can we do? And I guess if I can sneak in a second question, in terms of regional security, now that, say, a large portion of the self-defense force is dealing with crisis in Japan, I mean, how do you see that impacting regional security, particularly in the South Korean, North Korean Peninsula? Well, those are several questions. <laughs> <but> <laughs> That's right. Uh, Starting with the relief uh, effort. Too hard. Uh, um, I think, I think yeah. you might have comments on this kind of uh, um, uh, global relief uh, response you've seen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for all your uh, good read on that. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, we have been really uh, receiving a, a massive uh, offer of help uh, from the United States from all over the world, and we are really grateful to that. Um, uh, the, frankly speaking, the, uh, the area of devastation is so large, and the, uh, all the lifelines, uh, the, all the communications are once cut. Uh, uh, at the initial stage, it is very difficult uh, uh, for the uh, non-self-sustaining uh, uh, people to be there and to be helpful to, to, the, to those who are suffering. Only the, the military type of group which are self-sustaining like uh, uh, national self-defense forces are, are really e e instrumental. But uh, I think the things are, are getting uh, better and uh, now we are trying to uh, form a platform, uh, set a platform to receive 
and to 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 make a uh, a uh, uh, to match offers and needs to uh, to accept uh, the the volunteers <laughs> like yours uh, to if you would like to go to Japan uh, to uh, to be helpful. So uh, uh, in in the in the in the time to come, uh, if you are be a little bit patient, in the time to come, uh, the uh, there will be a ways uh, to to organize. Uh, organize uh, the all these good ways into to, into into something uh, really effective on the ground. And the second question about the second question uh, uh, for the national self defense forces. Uh, yeah, uh, you make a very good question. Uh, I have to say that now the our uh, forces are really stretched uh, because, for instance, when it comes to the uh, uh, army. We Almost 60, sorry, um, more than 60 percent of our uh, uh, effective is uh, being mobilized, and uh, uh, with or without uh, the uh, external threat, like uh, uh, like like what you mentioned, uh, it is not really uh, sustainable for for a long period of time. So it is an emergency situation. But uh, I would guess that the actual impact on regional security is pretty minor at the moment. The, the likelihood of the North Koreans actually trying to exploit this situation strikes me as extremely low. And in fact, uh, you know, one of a uh, country that might be considered one of Japan's regional rivals, China, one of the first things they did is they actually diverted two LNG tankers that were headed for China to provide liquefied natural gas to China and sent them to Japan, realizing that Japan was going to need more energy to replace the nuclear plants that were shut down. Mm -hmm. If I could just comment on the first question, I spent all day today in a conference uh, after action review of the Haiti uh, process and the Haiti recovery. And we've also studied the New Orleans uh, recovery from Katrina. Uh, the Kennedy School's had a project there over the course of the whole intervening now five and a half years. And we've learned quite a lot about how to, how to do recovery, how recovery actually happens. One important lesson is that recovery is done by the people who are there, not by people who are from outside. So I think the Consul General said this just right. First of all, it will take a while to figure out, for the people in Japan to figure out, people in these communities to figure out what they want to do and how they want to proceed. The most important thing that you can do as an outside organization is to be very careful to be driven by their realities instead of your assumptions. So you need to be very engaged with understanding what it is that they want to do. And much, it has to be driven by local leadership. All of the efforts where somebody's come in from outside and tried to run a p planning process or tried to top down uh, institute a new community building process, all the ones from outside fail. The ones that succeed are based on community organizing from inside where the outside groups, the volunteer groups and the, other, and the government from outside respond to what the people there want to do and enable them to do it more effectively. So, so put yourself in that role. So let's, we've, we're running out of time. Let's get a couple of more questions here. I'm not sure which of you, but oh. yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, my name is Rintaro Iwasaki. I'm an associate of US Japan program. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the, the great discussion. It is very helpful for Japan. Uh, my question is uh, how to rebuild the uh, community. Uh, the, some of us, you already have discussed uh, about that, but uh, the, the biggest uh, problem is that uh, there's so few manpower and uh, money, especially the several local government vanished just after the tsunami. So the the main point is uh, to how to get manpower and money from the uh, private company, NPO, and uh, some big funds, and so on. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, is there any uh, good way or scheme to make use of such kind of uh, uh, groups, like uh, private company, and so on? I mean, how to set incentive to participate to the rebuilding plan. Mm. It is, yeah, I think it is the biggest problem for uh, in two, uh, one year or two years uh, after the uh, big earthquake. That's a good question on private sector. Um, Professor Farr, do you want to take on that? 
wouldn't you like to cover yourself? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'll go first while they figure out who else it's is going to. It's a gonna. tough question. Mm -hmm. So the, the one thing I would just emphasize is the importance of realizing that this is not one event. It is many thousands of events that are different from each other. So if you look in different places, some villages were completely wiped out. In other places, in Sendai, much of the city is actually unaffected by the tsunami. And so there's a whole city there with resources. And the, again, the, the Japanese people have their own resilience. They have enormous reserves of both financial and physical capital. And the most important thing is they have huge res human resources reserves. People who know how to do things, how to build things, how to bring things back. So in some places, much of that is intact nearby to the areas of damage. And in other places, it's very remote. So we can't think of it as one thing. It's different. It's highly variable uh, about what happened and exactly where. So you have to be very careful to, to understand that we need to respond in a way that is highly decentralized and, and heterogeneous. But, but at this point, it's, it's rather hard. We don't have we information. Don't have information. Just as we no. don't know what's going on in the Absolutely plant, exactly we don't right. have really much of a detailed Absolutely micro right. look. And, and, that, that and will that's emerge. part of why the yeah. response looks messy in the beginning. And right. why people say, well, gee, why isn't the response more effective? It takes a while, as mm -hmm. the Consul General observed. It takes a while to find out. This is one of the rules of, of large-scale events, actually, is that you're not going to hear from the worst-off areas often, we say, in the first 30 minutes, often in the first week, because they are, they are, everything about them was wiped out. Their communications, their, and so very often you find out only later mm -hmm. where some of the worst-off events are. In fact, perhaps you could tell us the degree to which communication has been restored to some of the remote areas. Oh, yes. Um, there are still areas which, uh, in which the communication remains very difficult, but uh, uh, as days go by, uh, uh, there is a good coverage uh, of communication uh, which are now being restored, uh, especially through email. Um, I have noticed a very interesting uh, 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 phenomenon that uh, uh, the Japanese uh, telecommunication companies all who proposed uh, uh, the people finding service, but uh, their email system didn't really, uh, haven't uh, really well functioned. Mm -hmm. uh, but rather the uh, Gmail, which has got a server outside Japan, functioned quite well. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe that gives me an idea that uh, to have a, a really concentrated system in one place, uh, uh, as just you, you mentioned, for, for, the, uh, the, uh, for the example of DC-10, is a risk. And to have a de decentralized system will be a good solution, uh, which is uh, more resilient to the, the, this kind of disaster. And uh, maybe the, for the re-establishment of the community, that can work. You know, this uh, uh, network of social, uh, uh, social communication, uh, which are not really like the uh, communication center, the local authority, or the uh, local city hall, but this web of information can form a, 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 a virtual community, kind of virtual community. And uh, maybe the old, elder people can really participate in that, or in that uh, type of uh, communication, but uh, that, that's the role of the volunteers, maybe, to, to take the lead and uh, uh, involve the, the, the old members of the community into that uh, kind of new, uh, new kind of uh, communication to rebuild the community. So we have one last question and we're going to end. Hi, my name is Ajay. I'm a freshman in the college. My question is after the, um, uh, there has been serious fear of radiation all over the world, not just in Japan, even uh, in overseas, even in the US, not just in the West Coast, but even in the East Coast, pharmacies ran out of iodine tablets uh, all over the place, and there's a serious fear. So after this, how do you think this will affect general public's approach towards um, nuclear uh, energy all over the world, and how do you think this is going to affect the rest of our processing of nuclear energy? Well, first, I think it's too soon to tell. Um, uh, but second, I, I think, as I said before, I will probably vary country by country. I do think that there's been a lot of irrational fear. Uh, even the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, put out a statement saying, people in the United States ought to be saving the iodine pills for the people in Japan. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in case of uh, 
Uh, and uh, so uh, I don't, you know, I think a lot of the public fears are uh, grossly misplaced. Um, but they're nonetheless real. I would actually argue that some of the biggest real health effects of the Chernobyl accident were stress, depression, alcoholism, suicide, following, they were the result of fear um, as much as they were the result of, of radiation. So the public fear of radiation has very real health effects. Um, now, whether that will be true all over the world, I mean, there'll be some people who have significant increases in stress as a result of this on a, on a you know, a basis that isn't entirely rational. But um, I do think that in general, public skepticism about nuclear power will be higher and investor skepticism about nuclear power will be higher and that will mean slower nuclear growth than we probably otherwise would have had. And I think we've, we've seen uh, polls coming out, these uh, instant polls, and they've been varied in their message. But I, I think the one clear message that was coming out was that from the Japan nuclear situation that there was not a public health concern in the U.S. Now, some of the concern might also be more rational of people who live near power plants. So, again, you've got to separate out what people are actually concerned about and, and not assume that, that it's all about um, Japan, but kind of looking around them and re-examining. So, did you, one last comment. That it's so, uh, in all that, it, what is so vital is having authoritative information from a source that you really can trust in any situation because that is really what addresses these anxieties. And I'm sure in the Russian case you're talking about, part of the problem was so much information was simply never made available and people couldn't trust the government to tell them honestly what the situation was. Well, I think we've uh, drawn to the end of our time. You've been a wonderful audience and the concern in the Harvard community has been uh, amazing throughout the week, and I really appreciate our wonderful panel as well. So thank you to them.